And uh, are we meeting to order? And we will take roll call. Toby. Anna. Um, Alf Harrison. Here. Lois. Here. Dr. Smith. Here. No, right. Karen Powers. Here. And Jeff. Yep. And I believe those are all the board members. Oh, he's here. So, so Joshua is the only person no, not here. Paula. Oh, Paula. Oh, Paula. I'll follow for the record. I can make one for you right here. Are there mic um, The minutes were mailed out in our email. If I could get a motion to approve the minutes. I move to approve the minutes. On the second. I'll second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those nay. not in favor say nay. All the comment period. Any comments from the public? Anyone on Zoom? No, it doesn't look like it. Then to business. Okay. So I to welcome the new board member, but he cannot make it. So we'll move on to the second. Yeah, I, just, I met with Josh um, earlier this week. Um, I met for a good hour and a half plus just to give them some you know, basic information about the department, give them a tour, uh, <coughs> board member. And so look forward to seeing him at our next meeting. Who's that? Joshua Bellevue. He's a, um, he is a county board supervisor for District 19. Um, he was appointed uh, after a vacancy. I'm trying to remember who we did place. It's my version. Bob Peschel. Bob Peschel, yeah. Oh, on the board, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, we had a great meeting and look forward to putting on our next one. So, on to the second round of budget transfer 24650 from operations to capital to purchase XRF for the lead hazard investigation. Yes, um, thank you. This is a request to move, from, move funding within our existing budget now. Um, as you're aware from previous updates, um, uh, we have we launched a lead, avoid, a lead abatement uh, program at the health department using funds from uh, from a grant uh, that we applied for with the state to HUD. Also using funds from the state uh, that are called uh, LSHIP funds or lead safe housing funds, but lead, lead safe housing program funds, um, and then also a small amount of money from the city of Oshkosh. With those funds, we were able to create a new position last year. Uh, our lead abatement coordinator that's filled by Scott, he works in Ann's division. And since he's been on, uh, he's been building that program, um, building a contractor base to do lead abatement, recruiting properties um, for lead abatement. I think we've, we've probably put out five or six jobs now for, um, for bid by contractors. A couple of those are underway. And uh, I think we're just waiting for some bids on some others. Um, the that program is is getting going pretty good. Our, our current funding cycle ends in at the end of August, uh, end of September, uh, and we're already negotiating with the state for for the next year cycle. Um, we're hoping that we'll have about a about a one point six million dollar contract for additional lead abatement to occur uh, in the period from October through next September. That should uh, help us get many more homes enrolled in the program. Um, and the we, we currently have uh, an XRF, and an XRF is an X-ray fluorescence machine. It, what it does is it um, every home that has to be abated has to be inspected for lead and, and deteriorated lead surfaces. This machine, uh, and this is technology that's been used for many decades, uh, uh, helps us um, establish the um, the work orders for a property. So it, it helps us identify what surfaces uh, have lead in them. Um, 
cohort that are effective. And then from that, we write a scope of work, and then that scope of work goes out the bid. Um, we currently have an XRF on loan uh, from the state. We actually a regional hub. Um, we started a, a radiation program just to house that device here. Uh, it is on loan to anybody in the region. Uh, it's obviously getting some additional use now. And uh, what we would like to do is purchase an XRF so that when we have it, um, we know we have it 24 seven for when we need it. We can also use it as a second device to help um, accelerate those lead inspections with more than one person. And, um, and this XRF is also a newer technology in that it doesn't use a radioactive source. Um, it, it uses a, um, I think a rhodium uh, bulb that generates that generates X-rays when it's um, when it's in use, but it's uh, it doesn't require us to have a, a radiation protection program uh, as a part of having that device here. So, um, what I'm proposing is to move uh, funds that we already have in um, our other operating supplies to capital to purchase this device uh, because it costs more than five thousand dollars. You can see it's about twenty six twenty five thousand um, dollars that we need to move that to capital in order to purchase that. And so the request simply is no, um, there's no budgetary impact other than shipping funds to the capital category so that we can purchase the device per our county purchasing rules. Will this go before the county board? Um, you know, I, I, I know that when I talk to the county executive about this, um, I think it will. Um, there's, um, I know that there's some activity towards increasing the minimum limit of uh, purchase purchases or budget transfers that have to go to the Cole County Board. I don't know where that process is at. I know we were thinking we were talking about lifting the limit from fifteen thousand, perhaps to forty thousand, for budget transfers that had to go to the county board. Um, and so, depending on where that process is, um, this may or may not go. So the next stop for this would be personnel and finance committee, and that would be the first Thursday of next month. Does a machine like this have a lot of maintenance or recalibration or anything that's going to incur in expense year after year? Yeah, no, good question. Um, the uh, the machine goes through a, uh, a calibration uh, every time it's used, um, and then we additionally have you know uh, standards that we can test the machine on. The bulb is warranted for a minimum of five years um, and may last considerably longer, but it's it, we know it's warranted for at least five years. Um, one of the nice things about the machine is compared to um, a regular radioactive source XRF is that um, normally an XRF needs to have a new radioactive source put in, you know, the half-life is usually about 18 months. And it, uh, it, the, the, the older the source is, the longer the tests take. And, and so um, after about a year and a half and you've gone through a half-life, your, your tests are already twice as long as they would be when the source is new. Um, and then that's, that's an expensive process to maintain. So the price of the machine is actually fairly competitive, I think, with many of the traditional XRFs, but I'm guessing this technology will take off. So do we bear the expense of the existing machine right now? No, we do not. We're because it's on loan to us from right. the state. So the expense to us for the machine that we have now uh, is uh, was establishing and maintaining a radiation program in order to have a radioactive device at, at our location. So and but that can also be uh, loaned out at any time. We can get requests for um, anyone in the region for that device. And it, it will also require some resourcing at some point. We're not really sure what the state's plan is for, for maintaining that into the future. And the state could pull it back to any time they want it. Just another piggybacking on Lois's question. What would be the yearly maintenance for this device that we have for the experience? I, I think the only thing we would be planning for is a bulb replacement um, for this machine. Uh, for, for a traditional one, we'd be planning for more frequent <coughs> radioactive source replacements, but really it's just a, it's kind of like a light bulb. And so, we have the skills to recalibrate it. We would, um, so for, for if, that, um, if that bulb went out uh, within the five-year period, it would be covered, that would get sent in. Um, and I'm sure that we would probably send that machine in for uh, you know, the ball replacement and a recalibration that's necessary. <laughs> but otherwise, it goes through a calibration um, process every time you use it. 
So they don't, we don't need to send it in annually for a check, I don't believe, right? So the ball's not super expensive, or are they kind um, of pricey? You can't remember. I thought he said like $200 or $300, but I don't remember. That would be a lot less than a radioactive source. Oh, so a radioactive source is like $3,000. Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. No, we, we, um, We've looked at this for a while and uh, um, did some searches on, on that technology. We had a demo, a demo here at, at the health department uh, to get a better understanding whether or not we thought this was a good investment or not, because it is a newer technology. <coughs> but it's the, the benefit, um, it's really clear that without having a radioactive source, um, the machine can run faster for longer and, um, is, um, and, and it's very updated in terms of its ability to um, to record and transmit um, uh, the readings from the machine itself uh, to another device. And so it'll help save time as well. We've been in contact with the city of Milwaukee has at least 10 of them and they're ordering a few more. So they've been using them for quite a while. Uh, they have nothing bad to say about them. So, so how many tests do we usually do in a year and how many do you want to do in a year? Well, Miami yeah, might might be a little bit closer to this to me than right now. I mean, I mean we I mean we take dozens, if not hundreds, of readings in a in a dwelling um, every time we do an inspection. Oh, I didn't realize that. So you don't go until you just find one spot and say done. <coughs> you do every no, surface. Every single surface. surface. Every surface. Yeah. Every window sill, window frame, jam, door jams, door sash, frames, door sash. You, know, you do every. So it's yeah. quite involved, even like each one. Yeah, so it's a long, yeah, it's, it, it takes it takes hours to do a thorough investigation. That's just collecting the readings and hours more to really assemble a meaningful report. I think I think we were talking about what the, what our costs were in terms of um, doing an inspection and getting orders ready. And uh, you know, we were we were talking 20 to 30 hours of, of work it takes to just get a property ready for bid. So my request um, would be to um, approve the budget transfer to um, shift funds from our other operating supplies to capital to be able to purchase this machine. I move to uh, form the budget transfer. Second, as we proceed. And all those in favor say aye. 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 All those not in favor say nay. Yes. Thank you. And then we'll move on. If you don't mind signing that when you get a chance, because yeah. I'll forget yeah. it. And then if we'll move on to the director and staff. And I'll just get off for us. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> oh, Anna, did you have um, mm -hmm. What? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to take a moment with you. Um, to recognize Mike Norton um, and his service uh, to, to public health and his many years serving on the board, uh, many years, 23 years serving the county. Um, and Mike was a, a frequent visitor to, uh, to my office, uh, to the health department. He uh, certainly um, reached out to, to staff a wide variety of issues. Um, you know, and, and just, you know, very, very engaged, um, you know, and considering, you know, we didn't even drive, you know, his ability to, to get to meetings, get to places to make time for um, these civic events, um, you know, around his work schedule, um, just really wanted to recognize um, his service and everything that he brought. He certainly was um, truly, truly interested in, in using local government to to really better our community. So, um, just well, want to give an opportunity for anyone else to, <clears throat> if they had anything they wanted to say or any stories, um, and then what we wanted to just, you know, send this along to, to his family to let them know that, that, that he's, you know, he's missing. Well, what you put the, the wheelchair wash since he and Beth Roberts had, had started that, it was such a success from, from the first time they held it. So we had that picture there. Yeah, and it shows like he was willing to like get in and actually do the work and just show up for meetings. 
Yeah, and, so I, and I don't, I'm not sure for our citizen board members, I don't know if everybody knew um, that Mike had passed a few weeks ago suddenly. Um, and um, yeah, we were all caught up there by that. I was really appreciative of Mike when I moved to town seven years ago, didn't know a lot, and he was very helpful as an employee to tell me, okay, here's the ADRC, this is what they do, you need to get connected with the senior center, and um, always willing to make those introductions and give me plenty of suggestions of work to work on that wasn't <laughs> uh, So I definitely appreciated his work. He would always send us emails. Did you take a look at this? Did you hear about this? Or he'd attend conferences, like he'd go to the NACO conferences and, and uh, NATO, and, and he was really invested. And then he'd send us emails. I heard about this. I attended a seminar about this, you know, and it, his passion really came through loud and clear. I think what was really cool about Mike too is that he cared so much about the community and the people he was representing, but he cared about all of us as humans and employees too. Like um, we were driving back from WPHA last year and he was with us and out of the blue, he just started asking our whole team about how we feel about like the county benefits packages and if there's gaps and all of the things. And so he just randomly started asking us all these questions and he was really interested in, um, you know, the feedback that was coming from like even really new employees to the health department. And then um, was it last month that all became a topic of discussion at the county board meeting. And I heard Mike like sharing back information from that conversation and really trying to push, um, you know, forward on making sure that benefits are looked at and things. So I just really appreciated the advocacy that he had for our county employees too. So um, we'll, we'll be sure to pass this on and, and a link to the, the comments ever made here today as well. So thank you. <clears throat> um, Elsewise, in the department in general, um, staffing wise, um, we're, we have two vacancies that we're currently working on filling. Um, we are we promoted from within uh, the department, Mar Marissa <clears throat> I'm eager for. Uh, to a community health strategist position from our uh, Wisconsin Well Women program. So we're recruiting for a new bilingual uh, Wisconsin Well Women program coordinator. Um, we're also recruiting for um, a community health strategist uh, for our Drug Creek Communities program. Um, uh, Hannah Wills, uh, who's a community health strategist, um, also uh, interviewed and accepted a similar role not focusing on drug free communities and, and leaving that position open to financial division. Um, so only down to staff right now, um, and which is uh, which isn't too bad <coughs> considering what we've been through lately. So I don't know if there's any other staffing updates you guys want Lindsay? to in this one. Lindsay, the nurse that will be cool. Oh, thanks. Right. We just I mean hired a new nurse um, in Atlanta's division, uh, and she'll be starting June June, June one. Yeah, to accommodate the Oshkosh school nurse and is in a contract with the school district. Um, did a great job in her interview. Um, had an extended time period from which she could start, but it was certainly worth waiting for her to finish her contract out with the school district. Um, and so we made had a, a bit of an extended, um, you know, offer in time for her to start. Um, um, talked about Josh. Um, uh, you, you may notice that we did not put a COVID update on the agenda this month uh, for the first time. Uh, that, that's a positive thing. Uh, and uh, so just wanted to, to let you know that we are, we are really winding down uh, much of our uh, operations related to COVID. We have been, and I've been telling you that for a while, um, um, but we're also now winding down our reporting and tracking to the public. We'll be relying mostly on state federal uh, resources for that, which are also winding down, um, but we have uh, pulled back quite a bit on uh, how much work that we're doing in uh, in the tracking. Uh, we closed down Sunnyview for vaccine. Uh, that doesn't mean we won't offer vaccine yet, but we're offering just back here at the health department where there's not a lot of demand, although we probably will have a spike in demand very soon. 
um, as um, the FDA is now, um, you know, authorized and we're waiting for recommendations, more formal recommendations on another bivalent booster for individuals age 65 and up and, and those that are otherwise immunocompromised. So we'll probably have um, a bit of a spike in demand uh, since it's now been over six months since the current bivalent um, vaccine has been available. And for those that are those that are older and, um, and more immunocompromised, there's definitely a waning of the effectiveness of the vaccine uh, over that time period. And so a booster for them is likely to be very appropriate and will help protect them. Uh, we've seen other countries, the UK, Canada, and I'm sure others to follow that have already made that recommendation for vaccine availability for those in those groups. Um, tonight, uh, from uh, four to seven, um, we're having a, um, a volunteer and volunteer and staff recognition at Sunnyview for all of those people that came and helped us out over the past few years. Um, we had, in addition to hiring camp staff and project staff and reassigning our regular staff, we also had many, many volunteers, people just come and help out um, you know, in various capacities there. And, and as we're winding down, we really wanted to uh, take take a little bit of time to recognize, um, you know, what a big deal that was and, uh, and recognize them this evening. So thanks to staff for really fully putting that together. I'm not sure what our head count is for tonight, um, uh, but we'll be there from four to seven to, uh, to acknowledge uh, everything they've done. And this is part of our wind down. Anything you had wanted to add to that? No, but that's what we're in. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, we'll be kick, we're kicking off. Um, uh, so I'll just, I'll just kind of look a little different this year. Uh, the county Sex office is kicking off a new priority based budgeting process. Um, along with our regular budgeting process, there will be a, um, a prioritization process and just a different way at lo of looking at budget. Um, actually just got the kickoff email last night for trainings that are going to be next week. Um, but there's, uh, we're going to be looking at the budget from a program level and um, trying to make some decisions about priority of, of funding. And then to look at programs, not by department, but across um, the county itself. So, you know, if you were to take say public safety as an example, public safety, you know, yes, you think about that being in the sheriff's department, um, but there are there are many other things the county does in terms of public safety that you know, would qualify to, to fit into that program or umbrella. What we do, part of the intent here is to take programs like that and and really take a look at what our true expenditures are and pull together, you know, what the efforts are that are occurring across multiple departments that a lot of times we just don't see um, because we budget by department and we don't really budget by program. So it'll this will be a good learning experience for, for all of us in terms of um, hopefully improving um, our understanding of, of, of programming and how and what departments are involved with it and how we look at funding those types of programs going forward. So more to come on that. Um, was, you know and, and as usual, you know, as we get a draft budget together, um, you know, be happy to bring it back to for you guys for you and questions and you know help us make some good decisions on that. So that's um, those are made, those my major updates. I may have more after staff go, but I want to give the staff a chance to do their updates first. Who is next? Glenn. Glenn here. Doesn't matter what order the baby went. Looks like I'm next. What's that? I'm next. Okay. Uh -huh. So for environmental health, um, for our lead grants, Doug talked a little bit about those. Um, we have three houses enrolled in the HUD grant, and then we have 14 houses enrolled in the um, LSHIP grant. One project is totally completed. Um, all the work's been done. Everything's been cleared. Um, it's been closed. And then 10 um, of the projects are waiting for state approval. So they have to go through all um, Scott's plans and approve the work that's being proposed and um, approve the money. And then six are in the scheduling process for the um, lead investigation, the, uh, the lead inspection with the XRF. So that's going along quite well. Um, I think he's got like three or four contractors that are bidding on the, the project. So 
Um, that's really good. Um, we had none. One of the co um, contractors is yeah. from my, the Madison area, so uh, it's yeah. good that we have competition. Mm -hmm. um, yesterday we did um, the drug sort. Um, so in association with the Oshkosh Police Department, when people drop the drugs off in the drug, drug drop boxes, um, they keep all the drugs and then two or three times a year, um, the health department in association with the student nurses, UWO student nurses, sort those drugs. So um, we sorted out 822 pounds of prescription medication that was kept out of the landfill and then 500 plus pounds of like the, the containers, the plastic prescription containers went into the recyclables. So um, it took us a little under an hour to do 13 bins, probably the size of this table, this deep filled with medications. So it was it was a lot. Um, you, you can't even imagine what people are. Did you find a gun this time? Did we find what? A gun this time? No, no guns. <laughs> uh, no. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we did find that. We found teeth. We found money. We found all kinds of things. Um, but nothing, nothing fun yesterday. <laughs> so yeah, so we um, we it was a lot. So. The drop boxes are located at all the police departments. All the police departments in the county. Yep. So I think isn't tomorrow. Tomorrow national the national take back yep. day for prescription meds and yep. so I think Wisconsin typically is the number one as the number one state in the country for that yeah. program, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like we collect the most, or I think I think I think I think we collect the most. So it's our big public health. Karen has a question. Are these different from the drop boxes that are like in the pharmacies where you can get rid of your prescription? They're the same, the same boxes, but they go to a different. I don't. They don't come to OPD. I don't. <clears throat> so CDS will they, they, they take care of their own. Yeah, they take care of their own. Okay. Yeah. So this is just you know the public coming into the police station. You're opening up the red box and dumping whatever they have in there. So, okay. um, yeah, a lot of EpiPens, a lot of um, inhalers. Um, it was just just bags, gallon bags of pills. So some people throw the, the cold prescription bottle in, some people will dump it into a bag and just put the bag in there. So, so yeah. And how, how do we get rid of those things? So the, yeah, the, the medication is taken to someplace out of state and incinerated. Okay. And then everything else is recyclable. Yeah. That's good. How about the guns and teeth? <laughs> <laughs> money. <laughs> it wasn't that much. It was a couple pennies or something. <laughs> so then for the sanitarium program, um, we have a couple of new establishments. I know you guys like hearing about those. Um, it's been sort of slow on the new establishments. So we just have um, a tattoo company, the White Rabbit Tattoo Company, that was in Oshkosh. Sushi Lovers in Oshkosh open, and then a, a food truck called Bread and Butter Catering um, out of Fox Crossing. And I think I missed the event on the portion. Yeah, I did. Um, going back to the environmental portion, the lead and water program for licensed group daycares. We initially reached out to 10 daycare centers. We <laughs> sorted them based on population. We reached out to the top 10. Um, we heard back from one so far and possibly another one. So um, that one is scheduled for um, Thursday. So what we do is um, we're contracted with the state to go in and test all their water faucets. We do the first draw of the water faucet to see if there's lead in the water. Um, and if there is, um, we do a, a recheck and then if they find it you know, a high level again, the state will come in and replace all the faucets um, if they have a bubbler or you know some kind of water foam, they'll replace that if that comes up high. Um, it's no charge to the daycare centers for, for this um, um, program. So we just do the sampling. After they put the new fixtures in, we go back and resample to make sure that that did uh, fix the, the problem. So we, we do have one scheduled for next Thursday. So we'll see how that goes. It'll be our first one. It's a smaller one, so that's good. So we can get our feet wet on that. Um, and then yeah, going back to sanitarium, our special event season started. Um, we had the Wisconsin Public Service Farm Show, um, which is always a really good event for us. Um, we do a really good job. And we had a couple um, church fish fries for lunch. So we got those done, inspected. And it's licensing season. So we're printing our license renewals. Those will go out the middle of May. And those are due June 30th. Because our, our, our licenses run July 1st to June 30th. 
So that is it for each. I think. How would you check? I want to say private pools, but it's not like condo pools and hot tubs. How would you, do you check um, those? We're required to check those, inspect those once a year. Okay. So we, we inspect them once a year. Um, the outdoor pools, we try to do like before the season, like usually in May, most of them want to be open by, um, by uh, Memorial. Memorial Day. Yeah. So we try to get them sometime in May, early June. Um, and then if we get complaints, we will go in on a complaint basis. Okay. They're required to keep logs of their tests because they're in order to maintain those appropriately. And then they also inspect all the equipment, you know, any sanitizing equipment, any formation donation or anything like that to and, and to show those records to us um, okay. to you know show us that they've been you know monitoring and maintaining those those tools appropriately. Okay, very good. I think community health and prevention is next. Um, you're going to be hearing a lot more from me later of mm -hmm. we're going to do some intro to our division, but a couple of quick highlights um, and a couple of things that I'm hoping you'll pass out along for me. Um, so as part of our um, connection and belonging, social connectedness work, um, which is funded through an overdose data to action grant through this state. Um, we This is our third year of the grant. So we've done a lot of work in this area of understanding um, where folks are most isolated and what, um, what things are needed within our community and policy changes are needed to help foster connection and belonging. And um, so last, two years ago, we did listening sessions with people in recovery because some initial work led us to understand that um, folks in recovery, folks that identify under the LGBTQ um, umbrella and um, parents of two or more children under the age of 18 living in their home are the least social connected people, socially connected folks in our community. So we did some listening sessions with folks in recovery, began to understand this like um, intersection point of parents of two or more kids that are also in recovery and what that the ability to parent and um, stay in recovery and all of the difficulties that come along with that. So our next step in this is to um, host listening sessions um, with parents who are in recovery um, so we can figure out what our next steps are to help people maintain their recovery and feel connected into the community. Um, so Maddie, one of our community health strategists is working with um, one of the strategists in HLS to host these sessions along with solutions recovery. Um, so I can pass around some flyers if you have anywhere where you have connection folks, um, specifically with parents in recovery, um, that you'd like to hang a flyer. I really appreciate that. Um, as far as our um, transportation world goes, um, you all may remember that back in August, you passed a um, qualitative data for capacity building and alignment grant, allowing us to do some work um, to better understand the impact of the free student busing that OASD has been offering. Um, so we partnered with the Whitburn Center and um, it was a really great um, connection because they both did trained a lot of our staff on doing qualitative data gathering and qualitative data analysis while they were hosting focus groups and sending out surveys and doing all the qualitative data gathering. So um, they have completed their analysis and are ready to present into the community. So on May 10th, there's going to be an event to present all of this data and information back into the community. Um, it is free and open for anyone to attend. So we've got some flyers there if you'd like to join us to hear about the work and the impact of that plan. Um, I just want to mention that so the Whitburn Center is fairly new. You may not have all heard about that yet. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's the Whitburn Center for Excellence in Government or something like that. It's it's a, it's a based at UWO. Um, uh, Professor Mike Ford and Mike Ford. Sam Larson. Are yeah, he's the yeah. chair for that. So and they've they they put on some webinars and so it's they've, they've really a, a, a potentially a, for us a really great partner. Um, on this type of work and a, a more engagement for us with the university to um, really examine, um, you know, some governmental activities and, and, and benefits of, of that. Thank you. Is it possible to get more copies of these? Absolutely. Absolutely. I can grab those before you take off today. Okay. Um, 
Last couple of things as far as our substance use and substance use prevention work, um, you may have all already heard, but our overdose fatality review team um, in collaboration with Solutions Recovery launched a We Heart You app. Um, thank you for pulling that up. Um, it's a really incredible app that is a ton of resources in the community, um, kind of the full spectrum of substance. If you want treatment, there's treatment resources. If you need to find Narcan, there's a map of, you know, where you can find Narcan. If you want to talk to a recovery coach, um, they have a 24-7 live recovery coach there to answer your questions that you can text back and forth. It's, it's um, kind of a first of its kind, really incredible app. It just launched a few weeks ago. And um, last I heard, there were already 400 um, downloads of the app. Um, so we're really excited about that. When was it launched? Um, yeah, two or three weeks ago. Do you recall? 400 calls. Right? Yeah, there was like 380 within the first wow. couple of days. Nice. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. Yeah. And um, it's the solutions peer recovery coaches that are also doing the um, peer response team that are the ones that are an answering those calls. So, um, is it March 29th? That sounds right. Um, and then our Breakwater Coalition, which is our Adolescent Substance Use Prevention Coalition that has the Drug Free Communities Grant, which is also the position we're currently hiring for. Um, through their connections with Apricity, they hired a part-time um, coordinator to do social media and communications to just kind of increase the knowledge of Breakwater and Adolescent Substance Use Prevention. Um, and they are collaborating again with the Oshkosh North Communities Program. Um, and what that student group decided to partner with Breakwater on is um, creating spaces in Oshkosh for those ninth through 12th grade students where they can be together and um, have some fun host activities, but have those activities be substance free. Um, so they're pretty excited to see what that group of students comes up with. And I'll give you last more updates later. <laughs> Jamie, I think you're Jamie. on. Okay. <laughs> um, so WIC is going through our every two year audit right now. And um, I just have to give a shout out to Beth, Beth, if you're still on. Um, uh, we just had our fiscal portion of it, and um, I just did the office portion yesterday. But the fiscal portion, our regional director said it's the best she's ever had. And so as far as the region that she covers, which includes Milwaukee and all of those areas, um, that, that is a huge shout out to our fiscal accountant up there or account associate um, that she is doing a wonderful job and that we are all good with at least the finance part of it. Um, also, um, with the office part of it, it seems like we're going, it's going really well. I haven't gotten the, we'll have our exit interview with Doug um, as of the 28th of this month and then we'll really see any kind of findings or or things that they that they need us to improve on but as of right now she said it's going amazing and she thinks we hit it out of the park so that other than that WIC is business as usual and um do you have any questions the formula oh I do have one thing more more thing Julia the formula recall is actually winding down now so after almost a year I think it's open over a year um we're starting to come back around um, uh, where formula is starting to become more readily on the shelves and, and the normal stuff. Um, and we do want for WIC though to uh, um, have them change the way we do at the, the policy and procedure around the formulas at the state level. So we are hoping to see some change there, but we, we just don't know. So I love the formula that we offer. So, yeah, the policy, the policy is we really want to see change revolve around what uh, product, what formula products WIC is allowed to provide to participants. And, and for years, the state has had a contract with just with Simlab. And you know, so that is the formula that we're able to, to give. And last year, last year, or maybe even late the year before, um, there was a, a, a very large recall uh, for that. And that really, um, really impacted our ability to um, to get our participants um, with, with appropriate formula for their 
situation. But if we, if the state would allow more than one manufacturer um, as a as a source of that, um, it would um, it wouldn't create so much chaos when, when there's a recall, which is what's about to happen again at some point in the future. Um, I'll go next. Uh, we are working, my division, uh, our division is working on establishing a performance management system for the departments. So we are meeting with um, divisions and um, meeting with them and discussing <coughs> their projects and the work and, and putting it into a performance management system. So we're very excited about that. Um, in terms of community engagement, um, I will be facilitating the Fox Crossing Fire Department stakeholder meeting next week. And so I've had some really good conversations with the chief there. Uh, and I look forward to doing that for them as part of their accreditation. So that's kind of a nice facilitation opportunity. Uh, Doug already mentioned um, data changes for our COVID and, and how we're kind of winding down and and stuff, so I'm not going to go through that. Uh, our community health assessment. So our internal uh, CHA community health assessment team will be sharing the first draft to the community advisory team. The community advisory team has been meeting throughout the past six months or so and giving really good feedback to our department, our community health assessments. Um, so we're very excited about that. The next step is to conduct focus groups with community members. Um, one of the things that we pride ourselves in is to hear from community members themselves, not just the organizations or the agencies that represent certain <coughs> sectors of the population. So we're very excited about um, teaming up with um, some community partners and conducting some focus groups to hear from residents themselves. <clears throat> what matters to them in terms of community health. Uh, a few of my team members will, and Doug uh, as well, will be attending the uh, Emergency Preparedness Summit in Atlanta. And that is a very interesting conference. Um, so Shelly from Eagle, who's an emergency preparedness um, specialist, will be attending. It's a week-long conference, I believe, or four days in Atlanta. <clears throat> um, and Shelly's been very busy um, sending information out about the weather because at this time of the year, uh, if it's not a snowfall or a hailstorm or a flooding or a rain or a tornado, it's uh, emergency preparedness. Uh, she's very busy with that. Uh, in terms of communication, and Ashley Mukasa, our communication specialist, is here. Actually, now there's a title change so with our communication specialist. Um, her plate is very full. <clears throat> uh, big projects, small projects, media projects, she's got her hands in it. So uh, we continue to provide education and outreach through press releases, as you've probably seen, social media, our website is still in a continual uh, process of being updated, uh, newsletter flyers uh, to community partners. Um, and one of the things that we are now exploring is our translation processes. So. Um, there is a need to provide information that we provide, you know, in our flyers or brochures uh, in at least of the Spanish language, if not more. Um, so we're uh, looking at how the county as a whole, like our sister partner, Human Services, how they do their translations, who do they go to? Um, so we're looking at, at that. Uh, she's working very hard on finishing up the annual report. I think we'll be very happy with um, that when it comes out. Um, and also just tightening up our organizational branding. Um, so um, consistent look for our email signatures, our business cards. Um, so that's part of just organizational excellence. Um, so she's working on that as well. Um, and just everything else she does, you know, with media and her TV uh, appearances, uh, highlighting our, our services for the community. So she is one busy gal. That's all right. Awesome. You translated in Hmong as well? So we are looking at what our top five languages are so that we have at least something. However, 
uh, one of the ideas that we are uh, sort of exploring is to convene a small team internally of people who have seen the needs for this or who work with clients who come with non-English speaking and just hearing from them internally, okay, what do you see as a need? What do you think we need? And then maybe reaching out to the community and go, okay, you know, what are your needs? Hmong, the written Hmong language is, is a little tricky. Um, so we're going to be looking at all that. We haven't even started to kind of look at deliberately how do we provide our information in other languages other than English. I mean, there's depending on, on, on the product, you know, there, there may be, you know, maybe a good investment to translate into additional languages. Occasionally, we can just reference uh, similar materials that are already translated that perhaps are at a state or national level. Um, it, uh, try to try to weigh the balance of, you know, how we're, who we're going to reach and how much it costs to do translation for so many languages. Um, the, uh, I did want to piggyback on one thing Julia said on our community health improvement and uh, community health needs assessment process. Um, we've been working with um, our Tri-County Health Departments for a number of years um, uh, and working more towards alignment on uh, doing a regional needs assessment um, and then a community health improvement plan. And so recently um, we've um, We've come together and, and signed a basic agreement between the health office and the health, the, the health departments that helps define us working uh, together on that process, generating a single uh, community health needs assessment regional document. And within that, we can highlight you know any specific um, you know unique pieces of data for the individual jurisdictions as needed. Um, but in addition to that, we're, we're currently meeting with. Um, our four healthcare systems and working towards um, an agreement to do that with them as well, such that we really have a regional community health improvement plan. Um, we've also recently met with funders um, from the area, United Way, Community Foundation, um, US Venture, looking at hearing from them because when we, if we come together as health departments from the Tri-County area, and come together um, with healthcare systems from our area and lay out priorities um, as, a, as an entire group between hospitals and health departments. That's a big help to um, our area funders. It helps them um, prioritize what issues they want to fund and focus on with all of the, the funds that they have available for the community. So it really does help align efforts. It helps increase investments in um, in strategic areas, areas that we feel like we have the most need at the time that we'd really like to see the community focus on working related to improvement of health. Um, and of course, you know, many of those improvements in health are related to non-health department things. Most of you know them will be and you know it's you know how do we better address poverty, how do we better address education, how do we better address you know the access to benefits. I mean what are what are all the things that we can do as a community to improve health, and um, and the funders really appreciate knowing, you know, what we think in terms of where to best spend those dollars to have the most impact. So we look forward to more of that work. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Um, so the Tri County is Kelly Met Adelina Um and um, in the past we worked collaboratively to produce. Um, no, we worked collaboratively to collect data for then each agency to go out and do their own job. And this is sort of a revamp to say, hey, can we just have one community health assessment? Because we are more alike than we are unlike each other. If you look at that, that tri-county. So that's very exciting. There's, I mean, we're required to do this work. Hospitals are required as nonprofits to do reports. The timelines are different. So it's, it's just a lot of work you know, to, to generate alignment um, and a calendar and a process that that can work for everyone. Uh, so we'll be doing um, it will be doing documents probably more frequently than we're required to just to be on the on the hospital schedule. But it's definitely worth it for us to have a unified voice when it comes to health priorities. That's all I've got, Jackie. Ernest. All right. I'm on. Um, staff updates. 
we have a program called the Associated Infectious Pilot Program. Um, and our Amy Benninghoff was not, uh, she applied for that and she got that. That was one out of seven participants in the program. Um, there were five regions in the state. So there was five people from one from each region and two tribal individuals. And that is to help um, address healthcare associated infections, which are infections that occur in surgical procedures, um, catheters being placed um, in dwelling um, central lines, multi-drug resistant organisms, and those things happen all over. It is to connect us um, as a group, long-term care facilities. These are long-term care facilities and hospitals, people even in the community that get these in the hospitals. Um, is a great program. We're very proud of Amy for being part of that. She is great for that. Um, Six-month program starting in February, about five hours a week. And she's been bringing a lot of good information with us along with a lot of great connections. Late TB infection medication availability. We are running into shortages through the state. They provide medication for people with latent TB. Um, latent TB infection is people who are infected, they feel fine now. Um, but they may develop the disease later in life and infectious in their body slowly. The rifampin and rifampentine is in shortage to the state. Uh, it can be provided. Uh, physicians can order it from local pharmacies, and that is one that happens every day. But if you are uh, don't have insurance, and the state will help provide that for you, and we have these shortages. So we're dealing with it and addressing it, and we still have the um, it, but it's not the chosen, you know, the best route would be to have the uh, 3HP and we're in charge with that. We do have no program that is being um, brought out, welcome for. It's another way to uh, assist and bring in refugees. This is it's in addition to World Relief and most recently the U4U, United for Ukraine, collective effort of uh, organizations for refugee resettlement. There is uh, requirements that they have to meet. Many of the requirements the same as for a really great program, and we'll see how that comes out. Doug has already talked about the changes for the bivalent vaccine, and the changes in our walk in Wednesdays having ended, and, and that may be reviewed and renewed just for a short period with these updates. We'll see how that goes, and we have our event tonight. And then last would be community testing. Testing at Center U has ended, and so some will be ending their testing on May 15th. Uh, we still have a lot of the antigen tests throughout the community at local community centers, um, libraries, and, and all throughout both in or all throughout Oshkosh, Nina, Amro, Winnicani. So that is uh, available over there. Anybody have questions? Can you just Tell us just a little bit more about the refugee relief program is that up there? I was going to just jump in and say some a few things about that. So, okay. sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in Winnebago County or in our area, uh, World Relief is the primary resettlement agency. They are part of a nationwide program. Um, and we you know, we meet with them, um, attend their refugee resettlement meetings. They let us know about how many people they're planning to resettle in our area. Um, we've, we've had some discussions with them recently about um, how um, how they engage community in making those decisions about how many people are resettled, how they're resettled, what our capacity is in our area, um, and, and and we'll continue to do that. Those are decisions that are made by Rural Relief right now, um, and we want to. We want to find ways to better engage them with the rest of the community to help assure a successful resettlement into our community because you know right now the, 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 there's funding um, to help resettle individuals typically that expires within about 90 days um, i think we want to understand you know where where are where are the refugees at after 90 days where are they after three you know six months and a year later um, are we doing what we can to have a very successful resettlement? Um, if we're not, we're certainly not doing them any favors. And we just really wanna make sure that um, 
you know, we can be a part of, of that discussion to bring in additional community resources if needed for that and, and, and have a more open dialogue about capacity. Um, the, the other programs that Jackie mentioned, um, the U for You, United for Ukraine is a, is a federal program about um, bringing Ukrainians to the United States. Um, and then the third one was the Welcome Corps, the Welcome Corps which is also a federal program that asks for um, essentially for volunteers, groups of a minimum of five people or more, and um, I think $2,250 or something like that, having, having that, those minimum funds available, those minimum number of people available, and then you apply essentially to help assist resettled refugees that are coming to the United States. And, uh, and so those, that's, that probably is, is most of all our activity related to resettlement. Um, the, the areas where we probably have the most opportunity, um, you know, for community impact is is, is really advancing our, our our the knowledge of refugee health and refugee resources within the community and, and connecting that with local relief. The link is in the. Uh, we'll provide the link in, in the minutes. We, you know, we we want to help assure that when refugees are resettled, that you know. They, they have a minimum standard of quality of housing, access to transportation, um, you know, access to other resources that will um, help them thrive here in the United States. Is there any concern about, because like, obviously refugees could be a significant source of latent TB. Mm -hmm. um, is there any concerns with increasing numbers of refugees coming to their community that, with and the state in general, that this TB shortage, drug shortage, will be problematic. Yeah. So the the, the TB yes, um, the TB drug shortage is related um, to the newer regimens of treatment for TB. Um, we don't have shortages in you know in INH what we've always mm -hmm. used in the past, but it's a much longer course of treatment and it's harder to keep people on it. Um, and yeah, I mean the majority of our TB infections are in foreign-born individuals, so it is um, part of their health screening process when they come to the United States. Is um, uh, assessment for tuberculosis. I don't want to say more about it than that. And we are with local. It's just because of the scariest we realize that a lot of the providers even are not up on that and what to do. A lot of people are catching up with occupational health. We've been working with occupational health to get them more on board and on follow up and. Uh, yeah, I mean, I personally was affected by it. I sent them the sheet and they said, oh, no, you have to send me the sheet again because the meds you, you requested are on back order or whatever. And so I checked a different box and said, that it seems like it worked. But, <laughs> but, but we do remind individuals and the tenant physicians yeah. too, when you're doing the refugees, mm -hmm. you don't need to go through the state for that. Mm -hmm. thing if you get them in the first 90 days. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm just checking. This is in the area of the fee, but you talk to refugees, but that's mostly organized through the World Health, right? But what about the border situation when so many people coming in illegally or coming in and then are disappearing? Do we have anything like that in our state or in our counties? Do we have anything that the undocumented people are coming in or what, how we're dealing with that or what we're doing with it? Um, you know, I don't. As a health department, I don't agree with any formal programming. I think as a, as a health department, we, you know, we know that there are, um, you know, undocumented uh, immigrants in our area. Uh, linking them with resources is, uh, may be challenging sometimes. Um, uh, we, but we, you know, we, and we certainly try to um, direct undocumented persons that um, need, uh, you know, health resources, that sort of thing, to organizations that can assist them. But I don't have a whole lot more on that one. So. Yeah, okay. I just I, I just remember I was in the car business a lot. We did a lot of financing, and the rules were easy for them to get car loans and that. But then all of a sudden, now you can't get driver's license. You can't do anything there, and they're there. And and then um, I found that there was different companies between a farmer or a business or a restaurant that are using social security numbers. That aren't theirs, that are people that are dead. And the people don't know that. They have no idea that someone's collecting Social Security for somebody that's not around. 
but there was a, there seemed like a lot before this all happened. So I, and I and, and nobody at that time nobody was saying anything. Even the times you came up with and refuse a loan because it's fraud. Dealerships will not go after those places because it's no, nobody cares. And now I know what the situation now with more people coming in here. I'm sure that's going to be an issue where somebody is taking advantage of these people. And I just health department's got to be a big thing because they don't have insurance and have stuff. It's got to be, but I didn't know if we had anything in this area, but it sounds like we don't have much or we don't have I mean, stuff. We can, I mean, there are, um, so we work with a number of non health system health organizations, um, you know, our, our FQHC and federally qualified healthcare center uh, partnership, um, also local community, um, uh, the Hope Clinic that's in Menasha, uh, St. Anne's, um, Father Carr. So there are other resources that we can we can direct. Um, thank you. That we can direct people to uh, to assist them in that respect. Most of this is federal policy, and it, it's difficult for us to um, have much uh, say or impact on other than highlighting what some of the issues are that, that we're seeing. But you're right. I mean, it's I mean, it, it is difficult uh, if you can't get a driver's license, you can't get a social security number. I mean, it's it's tough for you know, people that enter the United States, you know, with, with, and to, to do that the right way is a very long process. Um, uh, yeah, it's um, it's tough for many of those people to survive as well. And there are other organizations like the Rural Health Initiative that about two years ago started working in Winnebago County. So the Rural Health Initiative um, is basically a group of staff, nurses, CNAs who go to the farms. Uh, and provide um, kitchen wellness. <laughs> you know, they sit around um, with the farmer and the, and the workers, uh, many of the migrant workers, um, and then they provide basic screenings, uh, health screenings, and then um, refer them to necessary resources in the community um, to keep that population as, as healthy as, as possible. And I know that the farmers are very appreciative of their work. So. That's another community partner that we have. All right. So uh, healthy lifespan. We are doing well. As Doug mentioned, quite a bit of staff transition and we're just kind of hanging on for Lindsay to get started. Please help share the bilingual um, post for us. We're really looking for a native speaker of Spanish. Um, that program has really been expanding numbers are going up and a lot of our numbers are new enrollees. We think that that's probably um, connected with the Medicaid wind down. A lot of people are getting connected with navigators that then tell them about this program. So that is doing well. Um, in the Dream Up Grant Coalition, this is um, surrounding the issue of childcare deserts in our area. And I'm sure you've heard it on the news. It's a big hot topic. There's a lot of business sectors, private sectors, public sectors coming together to solve this issue. Um, here, we had a grant for $75,000 led by United Way um, that just brought together the partners to talk and assess what they've decided to do with that money is create an application. Um, it's gonna be a very simple brief application that's out from May to July, but that will allow local child care centers to apply for funding, mostly for infrastructure things. So we talked about and going in and helping them assess lead or um, radon issues. If they can't mitigate those, they'd be able to apply and help get some of those fixes. Also training for staff. Um, the child care accounts support that was coming through federally is really starting to decline in May and it will end by the end of the year. So there's definitely some fear from our local centers of not being able to stay open anymore. Um, a lot of meetings, a lot of promotion going on. There's just really hasn't been that linchpin of, okay, where are we investing? How are we investing? And we know it's gonna take a group of not just government, but also a lot of these other business partners in the community. So we're working hard. Um, the Family Child Health Services back in full swing and um, staff really enjoyed actually being able to work with our participants again and have them in the health center. Our parent resource hours are still running and that is doing well. We're 
getting a little bit more attention from partners. So we had to have start coming in um, to help parents just kind of connect on multiple topics when they're here to see us. Uh, we're getting back out with our community engagement. We were approached by the day by day warming shelter. They have um, some expanded programming that they're starting with the, the new building and some new roles over there. So part of the model will be to have fixed beds that um, families can have that security knowing that they can come every night so long as they're participating in programming and they've asked us to help with that programming so we'll be going in there specifically working with more of the women which they've seen those numbers really go up mothers and women so i'm um, helping them with their health needs and connecting them to resources um, and I also just wanted to let you know, my, our division, besides Marissa and I, they've all been here 15 to 30 years. I mean, I've got very long-term staff and they have been voicing their appreciation for the intentionality of the pay scale and the benefits and our training. And so um, they've been around a long time and they've said this is the first time that they're getting that feedback and that transparency. So thank you to the board members who are intentionally putting some time into that. Um, I also was just allowed to start a uh, leadership academy with NACO, and that's got about 10 other staff from across the county that are participating in this cohort. So it just kicked off, and we get to talk to leaders from around the nation and go through that. It's pretty exciting. Any questions? Just a comment on that paid thing. I'm glad to keep talking about things and keep adding to it because, I mean, we really wanted that to go through. And we don't want it to end there because 2006 was the last time you really did something. And 2016, they just kind of blew it off <laughs> and then it come through this. But it was good to see that they did the first plan. They listened to everybody to see the changes. There was a lot of mistakes back and forth that was made in this, but they corrected those. But it's not done there. So keep putting the input because I think there was things they talked about that people that had been here maybe 18, 20 years and decided to take a promotion which is kind of the way this was set up would be not, would be better staying where you were than going where you're at. So they're adjusting for those times. So keep sending them those questions because they are, they, they told us many times they're, they're gonna really look into everything and try to come up better and better, not backwards and not forget it. So we spent a lot of time trying to get that, but we want to keep your every input in that. So it's important. So keep putting this up in there, okay, please. Thank you. Thank you. We're excited about, uh, folks looking into the benefits yeah. as opposed to just the pay. What did you just say? I, I said, I think uh, staff are um, excited about the opportunity to explore the benefit packages, not just the pay. Is that it? Um, so for uh, your income statement review, um, you received an uh, income statement via email, and then also um, when you came in today, uh, Sarah Jane always puts the other nice one page here for you to uh, to see um, without having to look through a four page income statement. You know where we're really at as far as our budget goes this year. Um, I don't know if there's any left here on the edge of the table. Have Otherwise, we have it here. Uh, um, so this is uh, an income statement for March, uh, three months or twenty five percent of the year. Uh, so you can, you know, where, where we're shooting to is to not ever expect to be any higher than twenty five percent, assuming most things are are, are even throughout the year. Um, and then, uh, and then to take a look at our income uh, related to expense, <clears throat> the, uh, as, as I always say, the, you know, the, the revenues are always two to three months behind. Um, and so our revenues always typically lay, um, our expenses. Um, however, for where we are right now this year at 25% for expenses, our overall budget expense total is only, is only at 18%, um, revenues that are 11%. So we're, you know, in, we're in really good shape right now in terms of our overall annual budget. Um, but there's questions about individual categories. I'm happy to address that. And then um, you did receive in, in your email a, a much more detailed income statement if you 
any questions about anything that's on here, I'm happy to do that. But this is just this is really our first update of the year because it takes the town now to you know have have some meaningful numbers to even show you for this year's current budget. Um, I don't have a total um, that's going into reserve from last year's budget yet. I'm just going to have that soon. Um, and I'll be able to report that out at a future meeting um, um, for this year and for last year. Uh, you know, we budgeted uh, uh, at least an eight hundred thousand uh, dollar deficit or use of the reserve fund to offset levy. And uh, and so when when you look at the income statement, you'll see that it's it is set up in you know, the bottom line for um, you know roughly an eight hundred thousand um, dollar. Over budget, which in those funds, those funds would be pulled from our reserve to, to cover that. Um, uh, we're we're probably a couple hundred thousand or more um, under that amount for last year, so we won't really be putting more money in the reserves. We just won't be taking as much out as we um, offered up as a part of the overall budget to offset levy last year. So there will there will be a decline in our in our um, reserve fund um, to help offset levy and those funds just go back and help reduce the levy um, and, we, and charge the taxpayer for last for the services of the health fund. Any questions on any of that? Just because it's a huge outlier um, computer software, um, almost a thousand percent over is just something yeah. that you do. It's, um, yeah, and, and so that's relative to budget. Typically we don't, um, we don't uh, budget for software unless we know well ahead of time that we're going to be purchasing a new package. Um, um, within the category that the computer software and our other operating supplies, um, you know, we're well within budget. But yeah, thanks. Some of those, some of those things that we don't know are coming or, or don't have uh, numbers for. Um, it's just not a routine. We don't normally spend that much on computer software, but if we if we end up with a new package or um, there's uh, an increase in the amount of um, interdepartmental uh, costs because IT has maybe changed part of the system and the charging departments. You know, sometimes we catch that at budget, sometimes we don't. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you have um, a budget of thirty-five thousand dollars for capital outlay, and you spent nothing of it. And is the XRF? A capital outlay, so, and if it is, could you go ahead and buy it without board approval since it's already in your budget? And then later, when there's something else you need to purchase, it seems that you wouldn't have to go through. You could get it immediately. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, when we put uh, dollars into the capital budget, they're um, usually allocated for a specific purpose or item. Uh -huh. um, that thirty-five thousand is in there um, for the replacement of a vehicle. Oh. Um, we, we budgeted for it last year, um, but we did not replace the vehicle. Costs um, on the state contract were not favorable, um, and we hadn't quite resumed back to normal usage post pandemic. And so we felt like we could defer um, that expense for to, to, to the fall to this year, and then we're reevaluating the replacement of our oldest vehicle again. So we have four, the health farm has four vehicles. Um, we try to keep them a minimum of 10 years, um, and uh, we're, we're, we're definitely at that now, but due to the pandemic, we had some reduced usage, and we're stretching that out a little bit further. So, so that's there for that if we spend it, um, and then uh, with your approval today, provided we have the other approvals that we need yet from PNF and potentially county board, that will increase our, our capital uh, amount from there for that XRF. Okay. Right, so as we um, 
been introducing you all to the health department. We've been going through all of the different divisions and it's community health and prevention's turn. Um, we have the longest name in the health department, so we tend to shorten that to CHP because um, community health and prevention repeated over and over and over gets really boring for all of us. Um, so I, you all get to hear from me all the time, but I'm gonna let my colleague here introduce herself quick and then we'll hop into the presentation. Uh, I'm Lindsay Erickson. I'm one of the community health strategists. Uh, I mostly focus on housing, stability, affordability issues, uh, and I've been with the health department for eight years. Um, I threw our picture up there because I am a person that likes to put faces to names. So uh, that was the CHP division. Um, this is all of our um, names and titles. So this um, division is primarily comprised of community health strategists. Um, and we have a variety of kind of educational backgrounds. Um, we have a person with a master's in public health, several with a master's in public administration, a bachelor's in science. The um, CHES is the uh, certified health education specialist. Um, so the community health strategists are really the ones that take on our issue area and do work through the two drivers of health equity and community engagement. Um, last year, as I think you all are aware, we were able to hire a harm reduction program coordinator. Um, that's Amanda Tennyson. Um, and then I'm the supervisor of the division. Uh, my background is a little bit different than a lot in the health department. I have a master's degree in social work and I'm a licensed clinical social worker. <laughs> Um, so I'm not going to go into like great detail about this, but these are kind of the mission and goals that our division really um, holds true. It's, it's kind of how we approach our issue areas, how we, um, we drive our work. So again, really looking at community engagement, how can we um, get the community involved in the work that we're doing, the decisions that are being made, really equip the community to kind of drive what we're doing um, through that lens of health. So this is a, a kind of a model that we use within CHP. We call it the Bar High in the Bay Area Regional Health Inequities Initiative. Lots of acronyms. Um, but this is kind of how we think about the whole scope of public health. So all of the divisions within the health department kind of touch on different pieces within this spectrum of public health. Uh, but really for CHP, we're focused more toward, towards the left-hand side. So looking at living conditions and inequities that exist within the community that might lead to some of the issues that we see more on the right hand side. So we're really looking at kind of root causes, uh, what are the, the things that exist within a community um, that might create some of those uh, health outcomes that we see. Um, and so we're really trying to center and listen to what are the community needs that exist on that left hand side uh, to inform how and what we work on. Next one. Um, this is another way to kind of visualize how we do our work. And um, mm -hmm. so we think this is kind of the thinking about when we use the term upstream. Uh, if you take an issue on the right hand side, say homelessness, uh, housing is an issue that we work on within uh, CHP. But homelessness can be a very visual thing that we see within the community. What we try to do in CHP is think upstream, uh, moving towards the left. What are the things that might be causing homelessness within a community? Uh, maybe it's different conditions that exist. Maybe uh, people are not able to find housing that meets their income level. Maybe people aren't able to access um, in a healthcare. Um, you know, maybe they're not able to uh, find uh, work that supports uh, being able to find housing within the community. Um, and trying to move even farther up, what are the policies, practices that exist, the systems uh, that may be creating some of these uh, outcomes. So on the flip side, what we're trying to work toward, uh, more of a the healthy stream. Uh, so thinking about what are the conditions, the policies, the systems that we need to have in place within the community that are uh, going to create healthier outcomes uh, for people. So making sure that we have access to stable, safe, affordable housing, making sure that people have access to the care that they need, uh, that there are safe communities, that people feel connected uh, within their community. So we know that all of those things can, can result in better outcomes. 
Um, so these are currently the four priority areas that we're focused on in CHP, um, substance use, social connectedness, housing, and transportation. The way we really framed out this presentation is that I'm going to be giving you a little bit of information on our social connection, um, substance use, and transportation work. Um, but then Lindsay is really here to talk more about housing and what we're doing in housing to just kind of help give a better overview on kind of how we frame out issues and how we do the work that we do in CHP. Um, so um, our priority areas in CHB can be kind of fluid because really what they are, um, the, the way we come up with the priority areas through data, um, hearing directly from the community, looking at the data that's available through YRBS, those sorts of things, and a lot of what comes up in our community health assessment and then what becomes a priority in our community health improvement plan. Um, so our team works closely with the planner and the administration division to try to kind of fill those gaps. So we um, we often want to hear from the community and um, look at um, what gaps exist, what the community identifies as their needs, and then again, equipping the community to help them fill, fill those gaps and needs. Um, so I've mentioned a lot in our various updates um, that substance use is a big part of our work. And we really have um, put our substance use work into three different buckets. So we have substance use prevention, harm reduction, and then what we call our substance use systems work. Um, so our substance use prevention is really done um, through the Breakwater Coalition, which again is that adolescent substance use prevention coalition that um, holds the drug-free communities grant. So um, the health department employs, employs a full-time coordinator that kind of carries out the work of both the CDC grant and the coalition. Um, so some of their accomplishments are listed here, the things that they've done and are currently working on. If you've never checked out the Breakwater podcast, I would really encourage you to do it. It's, it's a really great resource in the community. Um, they also host our cheers classes, um, which are educational classes for bartenders and um, folks in the community that need some additional um, help and support and um, making sure that they're not serving our um, minors in the community. Um, our harm reduction work is um, run typically by Amanda Tennyson with support from a lot of other folks in the department. Um, so that is our LifePoint Narcan fentanyl tester programs. Amanda's skills and abilities allowed us to expand that to also include HIV and Hep C testing. Um, and Amanda has become engaged on the state level in a harm reduction coalition, taking a look at kind of what's all happening at a state level and um, how we can standardize some of the harm reduction throughout health departments in the state. Um, our substance use systems work is led by Maddie Brigger, and um, a lot of it is done through the Overdose Fatality Review OFR team, which you've probably heard me talk about quite a bit. Um, so the health department is the fiscal agent of OFR, and we kind of helped um, create and lift it in the first place, and now we've provide some backbone support. Um, OFR is over 40 local partners that come together to review overdose deaths and um, try to offer up and then implement strategies to prevent future overdose deaths. So that's where the Solutions Peer Response Team, the We Heart You app, things I've been mentioning in here through our last several Board of Health meetings have really come, through, um, come from. Um, and then we also were recently awarded the COSAP grant, which is um, covering the costs of that peer response team and providing some additional support to the OFR team. And really excitedly um, putting a bereavement coordinator position within our medical examiner's office. And I believe they're actually doing interviews for that position within the next week or two here. So hopefully that should be filled soon. Um, and the purpose of that is to really um, cover some gaps in providing bereavement support alongside the ME's office as they are on scene and preventing future overdose deaths. Um, another one of our work areas, which I actually talked a little bit about before in our general division updates was, uh, is social connectedness. And so this is work that um, our health department is really kind of on the forefront of where we looked at throughout this state as um, to help frame out what social connection, connectedness and connection belonging means. So we've done a lot of data, data gathering and both implementation <laughs> of the program. 
Um, so through our data gathering, these are the three factors that have really kind of risen to the top as the things that, um, that are important to meaningful connectedness and engagement in the community. So strong relationships, a sense of belonging and meaningful contribution. And what we're really trying to focus on are what are those policy implications um, and things that help um, make sure people can feel connected in the community. So making sure that folks have places and spaces where they're safe to meet and looking at how um, policy really drives some of that. Lastly, and then you won't have to hear my voice for a little while, um, transportation is another um, area that we're focusing on, really that equitable transportation, transportation trying to ensure that um, anybody in our community can, can get where they need to go when they need to go so they can access their employment and their health care and all of those pieces. We really look at um, equitable transportation as an essential function of urban infrastructure. So it's just as important as having roads and bridges and tunnels and those sorts of pieces. Um, so that's work that's done with a lot of community partners to look at any barriers to transit and how we can address those barriers in the community. Um, I mentioned earlier the qualitative data grant that falls under our transportation work. So there was that free busing option for students at OASD and um, we received that grant to assess the impact of it, um, the efficacy of it to help the help equip the city and those that are in a position to make decisions about whether or not that continues um, have all the information they need to make that decision. So we're gonna jump into a little deeper dive into housing both uh, because housing is kind of a newer uh, topic area for public health to work on. So if you're wondering why, why would we touch on housing? I'll explain that. Um, and also to kind of give an example of how we go about doing this work. Um, so I'm gonna talk through kind of three uh, legs of the stool, I guess, of how we think about housing, how we frame out housing from a public mm -hmm. health perspective. So we know that housing is very foundational to people's lives. So if someone doesn't have access to housing, it's really hard for them to be able to work on all of the other issues that they might experience. So we think about kind of three areas. So stable housing, uh, meaning that people can choose when and why they move. Uh, so if people um, are forced uh, to move frequently, we know that can impact especially children having to either miss school or change schools frequently. Um, this might include you know, eviction. That process can be very stressful, both for landlords and tenants. Um, and being forced to move may force people into more low quality housing. So that moves into quality housing, making sure that people have safe and healthy housing uh, that's free from um, any kind of safety issues, hazards. We've talked a lot about lead abatement before that's included within that quality housing. Um, but looking at what's what's the state of our housing within our communities uh, and making if we know that uh, if people have to settle for lower quality housing that may also strain uh, folks budgets um, if they're trying to move into more quality housing so also making sure that we have affordability within the community at all different income levels uh, so making sure that people can afford their housing which is typically a third 30 percent of uh, people's income uh, that's People should be paying more than that. That tends to be a, a pretty stable uh, rate. And that's to make sure that people can also pay for all of the other things that they need for themselves and their families. So uh, we know that if people are paying uh, too much for their housing based on their income, it can make it harder uh, to keep up with rent. They may have to double up, uh, may lead to homelessness, uh, which obviously has a very direct impact on people's health. So these are kind of the three ways that we think about uh, housing uh, from a public health perspective. So we'll go into, uh, you might have seen uh, this graphic before, but these are all the different types of housing that need to exist within a community based on people's varying needs throughout their lifetime. So everything from kind of emergency shelter, something like day by day, public cars, Christine Young, domestic abuse, those are providing emergency shelter just to get people out of the elements into a safe place. Um, and then moving throughout this kind of spectrum of housing, so more supportive housing that might be more short term. Um, that could be something like uh, uh, sober living homes that recovery, other recovery organizations provide. 
Moving into longer term supportive housing, this might be for folks, um, uh, Covey is an example for folks with adults with uh, developmental disabilities may need longer term support. Um, this could also include uh, as people age, maybe they own their own home, but uh, realize they may need more supportive housing as they age. So people can move throughout this, this wheel of housing throughout their lifetime. Um, but our role within public health is really identifying where are the gaps within any of these pieces of housing in the community uh, and how can we build relationships with the providers of these housing uh, options to make sure that we can fill in those gaps. So this is sort of a, a roadmap, uh, literally, of, of, of how we've gotten to where we are working on housing. Uh, so back in 2017, this is really when um, housing within CHP, our work started emerging. At that time, I was working on tobacco prevention, um, and a, a new HUD rule had come out that all public housing uh, uh, buildings had to be smoke-free. Uh, so I was working a lot with the Oshkosh Winnebago County Housing Authority, uh, trying to help them with you know, education, making sure that all of their tenants had the resources they need to be able to um, uh, meet that re new requ requirement. So because of that relationship building, we identified this is a, an emerging issue overall for housing within our communities. Uh, so from 2018 to 2019, we took a lot of time to understand the data around housing, uh, understand the conditions, build relationships with uh, providers of housing, people experiencing different housing issues uh, so that we have a good understanding of what's actually happening. Uh, 2020, 2021, um, that's when uh, housing really came to a crisis point, especially related to evictions. So I was part of the Winnebago County Eviction Prevention Task Force. That was a group of uh, various housing providers uh, looking at how do we uh, make sure that we can keep people housed throughout the pandemic, knowing that that was a huge risk if someone was unhoused, uh, all of the other issues that could come from that. Uh, that's when we also became engaged with the Winnebago Land Housing Coalition. Uh, I'm a part of that coalition. And then my colleague, uh, Susan Garcia Franz, is part of the Fox Cities Housing Coalition. So we've kind of uh, split up Fox Cities Housing Coalition covers the nor northern part of the county and Outagamie County, Winnebago Land, land covers southern Winnebago County, uh, Green Lake, and Fond du Lac counties. Uh, this is also when uh, we wrote the Neighborhood Investment Fund. Uh, grant and so that grant really pulled together uh, some years worth of relationship building, understanding what was going on within the community um, to be able to fill in some gaps that we knew existed within uh, that, that kind of wheel of housing. Uh, and now we're really focused on and, and hearing from the community through partnering with Esther. They've been doing some housing conversations focused on various groups and issues uh, within housing. Uh, and that through that, we've, we've heard a lot around uh, the need for affordable housing for all different kinds of income levels. Um, and there's a statewide uh, network that we're a part of that's looking at how do we address affordability within housing. Um, so I think, so that kind of shows like how we've uh, gotten to where we are within housing and kind of the process that we take within CHP as we identify an issue that's raised within a community, such as housing, how we go about uh, addressing that. Any questions? <laughs> um, well, this is kind of a crazy, I don't know how you guys can do all that. It's really tough. I mean, I think, didn't they say not too long ago that we're gonna be 3,000 houses short in the next couple of years for people living? And then, I happened to go through Covey yesterday and uh, you know they have 28 people that need to be placed in the house they're building but they need the fund for is only four. <coughs> that doesn't quite do that and that's a small area. And then as I look at all the housing stuff that's being built, it's all you know, 13, 14, 15, 1600 dollars a month for a small place. I mean and, and you're on social security to eight hundred, nine hundred dollars. I mean, that's not even possible. So I mean, your ch the challenges you guys have is pretty tough, you know. I mean, how do you do that? Um, the other thing that I didn't notice because I've been doing a lot of this in this area, 
is it seems like a lot of housing that was done in the past that around the Oshkosh area around this area, the housing was done on grants that they would have housing for you know poor people or you know lower income. They did that for a couple of years, got the loans and did all this. But now I have friends that have tried to get into these places and now the rent's higher and they don't really rent the way they were granted. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that the idea was they got money based on that to do low income people in there. But now because they hadn't gone through and maybe had some bad experience, they decide now they're gonna go to the next level. Because no one's really checking to see if the grant is being handled. So, I mean, it's tough, you know? So, and, and the, the people I talk to, I mean, there's no way, you know, I mean, that, that's more than my mortgage, is it? In a way, twice my mortgage, you know, and stuff. So it's got to be tough. I mean, it's kind of tough. I, I don't know what the solution is. And I see them building and their projects going up, but they're all saying on these projects that there more people are going to come here for better jobs, but it doesn't really deal with the situation, that I think. I mean, I'm sure you're seeing all this, right? Yeah. I just, how do you, you know, the tiny houses, uh, even I went through that. And they, you know, those are nine hundred fifty dollars, and people pay what they can for the eighteen months that they're there. But that's still nine hundred dollars, and they pay back that. So it's kind of a rough area. But you guys got to deal with it, I, I, you know. Yeah. In, in tiny houses, you would think would be, you know, they're not cheap. I mean, we just talked about somebody else is going to build. So I think for the nine eighty, those houses, you know, mm -hmm. they decide to cut back because they're too expensive. So, I mean, it's, it's, I, I don't know how you can get around that. It's got to be a tough job to figure. I want to be a community health strategist as well. Uh, <laughs> Join yeah. us. I mean, I just, I, I'm just shocked. I, I know you're doing all that. I see all that. I just, I, get, I mean, you know, you almost got to, even even the co-op upstairs, that was a lot. It was supposed to be that. And I just saw an ad in the newspaper and there were 15, 1600 dollars lots. I mean, I mean, the project's got to be the low income period. And they got to stick to it, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and 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 if they don't, and that that will be something that'll be tough to go. Because I, I anybody, you just want to have some place for your family to live and stay to start out, and then the job and all that comes. But it, it's just so hard to get that. I, I I commend you on your job. I I, don't, I just I keep looking at it, trying to figure out how to do it, but everything is kind of it. Oh, it almost and all the stuff that I looked at, it seems like our our society or our area are putting money toward bigger things and things that you know from I mean everything I looked at just forgot some of the stuff on the bottom and don't worry it'll go away it'll be fine um, you know but have, they put all the money to bigger and better things and really haven't addressed that at all and I can and I I've been on this crusade for the last six months and it just shocked me how and, and it's my fault just like anybody else's because I worked a lot, but I never saw any of these. And I had wrong ideas about all these nonprofits, all the different things going on. And it just shocks me that our community seems like they've forgotten that. They, you know, we say we're doing it, we're gonna try to do it. Um, but it seems that area we kind of just let them go on their own and we'll do our own thing, you know. I'm glad that you're doing it, but I don't I don't know what the next move to get to push it because it, it is really serious out there. It's not, you know, the pandemic and all that. I mean. You know, we don't have no idea what people went through. They couldn't do, we couldn't get shots, couldn't get out of the house, couldn't do this. Or there's so can I make comments about yeah. the government grants? Yeah. And but usually you have a 20 year commitment, and you are monitored every year. Yeah. So to say that they're not being monitored, I'm sure they are. Okay, but I, and again, what I was saying by that is that it was low income, a lot right off of Main Street, and. People went in there, friends of mine, now they don't even qualify to make a lot more money than the minimum was supposed to be at the beginning. So they got turned away. And I was just trying to figure out what they're doing. But like you said, but uh, I mean, is, is, there, can, is there a place you can get an apartment for five or 600 bucks? Not one that's no, decent. Not quality. nice, right? I mean, so, you know, yeah. if you're sacrificing that in the three circles that I it's, showed, yeah. there's usually a piece then that's, that's yeah. missing for drugs. And even when I came to college here, I paid two hundred fifty dollars, and they put up a wall when, in the, the, when I went to school here, and that was my room. You know, <laughs> that's what you got. But there were seven of us in there, so it was nowhere near, you know. And it's tough. And I had a friend just recently; she got a divorce, is trying to find a place for five or six hundred dollars. She couldn't find any, and got turned down for a lot of things. And she makes a lot of money, you know, so it doesn't make any sense, you know. So what is a person that doesn't make any? How how do they get any? 
you know what I mean? I really appreciate you saying all that, Ralph, because I think that, you know, the job of a community health strategist is a little bit like being a chess player. Yeah. And like, it's a lot of work for really kind of small strategic movements that we hope kind of move the needle, so to speak. And I think that really describes housing work quite a bit in that, like, it's a lot of partnerships and development and helping folks kind of understand the importance of housing being available in all stages of that wheel. Is there anything now that we got going that you got some projects going or that people are willing to start building some houses that are affordable? I think I think there's been some more momentum because of the the work like Rosh Kosh Kids Foundation has done, some of the projects that we've been hearing yeah. about. I think now there's more attention and visibility of, you know, people see all of the, the apartment buildings that are getting built and seeing the rents, mm -hmm. you know, who can afford that. Right. So I think there's more conversation about how do we prioritize more affordable housing for people who might be on the lower side of the income bracket. Um, and how do we, you touched on this too, how do we actually preserve that as affordable right. so that it's not, you know, after 20 years and the, the rents. Yeah. Get raised or stays consistent. So yeah. have place. And I know there's always a problem with the people leaving and the house can fit. But a lot of times it's because it seemed like a lot of the ones is because the landlord and them aren't getting along. So they abuse it. And you can't kick them out. You got to go to court to do it. So they damage the place because they're mad. At, you know, if, the, if a person felt good about their pride, but the good of the family and their housing, it probably would, their life would be a little different than, you know, feeling that they're at the bottom and that's the way people are. You know? so, I'm just saying that because I just, I compliment what you're doing. I just, I wish I knew the exact solution because yeah. I, I just, in all the time, the last six months, I, I just, I really shocked what has happened and, 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 and not been dealt with really, you know, yeah. just terrible, terrible. Yeah. Well, Ralph, uh, Ralph, can I just make one comment? This is Susan uh, Garcia Franz. Just want to let you know that policies like C, um, CDBG, the um, community development block grants that come into cities are really critical funding elements that keep affordable housing on the docket for there's entire plans made around them. So if we can get more of an influx of those types of funds into municipalities um, moving forward, then that if that continues, then um, and look at some of the other, the private and public private partnerships uh, elsewhere, then um, it really, there's a little, a lot of potential out there for more projects. It's just that that influx of money is really important. That infrastructure money is important. And we hope to continue to see some of that come um, coming in our area. Thank you, Susan. A quick question, I think, and then kind of a frivolous one. On the highway thing, you had, you know, the non-smoking um, thing, and then, Another part of the story was eviction prevention task force. So are they sometimes at odds when if somebody is smoking, I assume they can be evicted, but then you get to eviction prevention task force. Are they fighting against each other? And no, I think uh, working with the housing authority, I, I learned I think they're really focused on how do they keep folks housed, how do they work with people if maybe they are, you know, uh, uh, smoking, how do they work with them to make sure are they wanting to quit smoking what kind of resources do they need to um you know be able to smoke outside if they need to so i think so the housing authority was uh with us in the that eviction prevention task force and that task force was really focused on if there's issues within housing that uh, before might have led to an eviction how do we work more closely with people um to try and prevent an eviction from happening are there things that we can have in place so that we work through that problem without having to go through an eviction because that can be costly both for the landlord and the, the tenant. Okay. So my, my, oh, no. my first question was, Lindsay, are you two related? Do you have the same last name? No, we're not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was like, no, we don't even have the same last name. <laughs> well, you did. You went off and changed your name. No, behind you. Oh, <laughs> Atlanta, behind you. Oh. <laughs> as far as we know, we know. So, okay. Yes. We get that a lot, though. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Mr. Person. <laughs>
So, so I have a question. I don't know if this is the best place to bring it up or not, but I'll try it. Is um, I mean, there's a fairly significant amount of money that's coming through or has started to come through with the opiate settlement. Okay. And obviously, this is an area where some of that money can sit. Do we know how that, where that's coming from, how that's going, what's going to happen? Because I know some of it has come to the county itself, mm -hmm. not through the health department, but into a general county coffer. And then there also is a significant amount of money through the Department of Human Services with DHS and with, you know, on the state level. Is that correct? Yes. That, that I... may be granted out or will be granted out? We don't know what will happen with the state level funds yet. We anticipate that there will be some grant opportunities available to access some of those state level funds, but I have not heard specifics on what that will look like. And I'll defer to Doug to talk about the county level funds, if that's okay. Yeah, definitely. And really there's there's still two pots of county level funds. Um, there's ARPA funds that have yet to be decided on completely on how they're gonna be used yet. And there's definitely opportunity to address housing with some of those funds. And in terms of the opioid funding, um, the settlement funds, the county has started to receive that funding. Um, the, the county has established an account and um, um, for those funds, the county board has resolved to um, uh, uh, have to approve the use of those funds. So any funds that come out of that have to be approved by the county board. There's currently a little over, I think we've received as a county a little over a million dollars of settlement funding from the manufacturers, the opioid settlement mm -hmm. manufacturers. Um, and over the next 16 or so years, um, we'll be receiving additional funding. I think the total amount is you know, somewhere in the $3 million range. Um, and then there'll be a second, there's a secondary pot of opioid um, settlement funding coming from the um, uh, pharmacies, the retailers that should represent roughly 80% of the amount that came from the manufacturers. So there are there is several million dollars that will be coming over an extended period of time. Um, and we've begun conversations uh, with the county tax office uh, and, and started pulling partners together. Um, uh, we've engaged our um, uh, overdose fatality review leadership team um, yeah, as to, to start those conversations about um, providing some guidance and recommendations related to the use of those funds uh, that we can present back. And so uh, recent, most recently, just conversations with the county executive about um, you know, pulling, pulling those people together to start making those recommendations because we haven't formally really done that yet. So we have the money, we're just not doing anything. Well, there's, <laughs> so money is on the way. Uh, some we've received, some we have not. You know, of the of the million or so dollars that have been received so far in 2022, um, a little over a half of that was allocated uh, in, in as part of, I believe, the human services budget for the Connect program. And then most recently, the sheriff's department asked for uh, a smaller amount um, to purchase um, uh, some drug identification equipment. Um, so there is there are several hundred thousand that has not been allocated yet. And of course, and then there are millions coming that we haven't received yet that we um, that we're, we've started working to help make, help the county make a plan for. So most of that million is allocated already. So I believe um, I believe a little over half of that um, was budgeted for the Connect program. Um, so as part of as part of our work, trying to help. Um, make recommendations on how to use those funds. We'll be exploring that, how much of those funds are gonna be used, um, what is the, what it was gonna be the continued cost for the Connect program. County Executive has the Connect program as a priority for the use of those funds. Um, what is the Connect program? I, yeah, so the Connect program. I mean, not, not the accident. No, no, that's okay. Um, so the Connect program, um, and I'm probably not even going to explain this 100% correctly because it's complex, but it is a program run by your human services department that is housed within um, the district attorney's office building. Um, so connect is kind of the umbrella term utilized to describe all of the diversion programs that, um, that are run either by the DA's office or by human services. So like um, 
drug court, um, the 24 seven alcohol, 24 seven drug, like all those different programs. And then I think ultimately the goal is to, um, to have services and kind of like navigators, connectors available within the connect program. So folks, when they're released from incarceration, it's kind of a one-stop shop to get connected to services that they need. So were these programs that were already running and they just was back funding them? So. I couldn't tell you how it's financed in a way that would help. Because I mean, like, to be honest, like the people who are coming to me are very frustrated, like, hey, we're supposed to get all this money to help with services. Are they really helping people? I think is the, the sort of the frustration that I'm hearing. And it's sort of like, well, I'm like guessing they already funded it somewhere, put it in some pot or something, which I mean, I guess is what's going on. But it's it's an interesting thing. I and mean, I think that's, I mean, one of the purposes of me coming on this is, as people may know, I have significant expertise in this area. Mm -hmm. um, and I have not been really tapped much. So, yeah, and we really just had our, <laughs> Our first conversation with um, with our with our core leadership partners from OMR mm -hmm. to start this process. So that just happened this past week. Mm -hmm. So and 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 we've also um, been interested in um, you know how we're going to direct those funds, how we can do that in a, in a, in a timely way. Um, so it's a it's a work in progress, and hopefully over the next couple of weeks. I'll, I'll get a better understanding of how much money is actually coming and when from both settlements. Um, and then we can use that um, information to help guide some decisions about how we would recommend those funds be used. Ultimately, it's going to be the executive and the county board that will determine how those funds are spent. But it's it's definitely an important piece. It's a great opportunity. And that's why um, I think, you know, we're trying to, try, trying to lead some work to um, get those recommendations made. But I think ultimately we'd be happy to hear about all of your suggestions mm -hmm. and ideas on how those funds can be utilized. But they haven't been spent yet. You want to be clear they're talking about where they haven't spent yet. Well, it sounds like, I mean, at yeah. least half a million dollars has been spent. I'm sorry. Well, half a, I believe a half a million mm -hmm. was budgeted. budgeted. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know how much has been spent. Yeah. yeah. So, and the same thing with ARPA was 33 million, yeah. 500 and some thousand is the interest that's been sitting there. And they just spent, we just spent $10,300,000 uh, just recently for projects, but had nothing to do with anything health wise or anything. Mm -hmm. So there's still $23 million sitting there that hasn't, mm -hmm. hasn't done anything. And then they're trying to decide what to do with that. The only thing they did this last time is they decided not to give nonprofits 25%. They decided to take that away. So it's all government infrastructure and stuff. So it's not. And that was a big thing this last one that the nonprofits don't think got tough done in there. So, but they haven't done any of that. So they're still sitting there. And they got them up. Well, it's still a way forward um, for nonprofits. Not all of them, but there is still a way forward for them to receive something. But I mean, I've been in this long enough that I've hung out with the, what happened with the tobacco settlements. Mm -hmm. And most of that didn't go to anything to, that had to do. And, and I mean, it feels like the same thing, to be quite honest. It, 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 like that there, I mean, there, there looks like they're safeguards, but, and so, I mean, that's my two cents, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we're just, we're, we really do want to try to help assure that the opioid funding really goes towards addressing, you know, mm -hmm. treatment and prevention moving forward. I think we have good commitment from, um, the county executive and really you know, resolutions from the county board that um, require their approval for the spending of that money. Uh, that should help assure that those funds are spent uh, on opioid related initiatives. Counties, you know, that are receiving those funds um, can do whatever they want with them. Um, I think Winnipeg County has already made steps to try to assure that they get used for opioid related activities. So that's that's a positive. And there's also, you know, so the of the um, manufacturer settlement funds, um, you know, there's roughly a 30 70 split of those funds that are 30% going to the state and 70% going to locals. Of course, we're one of 
you know, dozens and dozens of locals that are receiving funds. So, you know, the, the largest pot of funding is with the state. Um, uh, the state has made um, planning uh, plans and recommendations for the use of those funds. What we're waiting to see actually get incorporated into our next budget, uh, our next biennial budget, state budget. That will help also help inform us as to um, are there plans that we have in place or things that we are funding now that the state will be able to fund so that we can, um, you know, make better local decisions with those funds. So, you know, if, they're, if the state's going to continue to to, to fund Narcan and fentanyl test strips and you know other harm uh, reduction activities, we can use funds for you know looking at okay, what are some other upstream community level things that we can do with those funds here to have a longer term impact. Can we? Is there anything? I'm sorry, I didn't ask. Is there anything ARPA wise that the health department can submit for some of that money? So are they? Yeah, we're monitoring the process and uh, in terms of you know what decisions are being made by our commission and the, and the county executive. Um, and we're really um, eager to offer some recommendations on, on the use of those funds once the commission you know is is in a place where they understand what they can and can't do with the funds. So you know this 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 was a there was a big change when the county board said. You know, we're going to eliminate the category going to nonprofits. I agree with Karen. That doesn't mean that that, that can't happen. It's just that we have to define a better process for that. And we're, you know, we're observers of that process right now, and we will try to help inform it. But it's it's really not our decision on how those funds get used. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. We will move on to our next meeting, um, June 16th, it looks like, unless we have a meeting made. I don't have anything right now that I, don't, I think that, that can't wait. So June 16th would be great. Although I believe it may be out of town, not that that's an issue. I mean, we can still have a meeting without any of it. I would. Um, yeah, I encourage you to go ahead with that. Um, in the Board of Health Reports. Mm -hmm. And then, we encourage your adjournment. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And we'll see everybody on June 16th. All right. Shortest meeting in. Yeah. 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 yeah.